Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Episode 2 of Hard Knocks, another really good episode. It was different than the first one because in the first episode, it was very family-driven. They went to Leonard's house. They went to Wentz's house. In this one, they still talk about their family, and they show a lot of their day-to-day life we saw deforest buckner going to grover stewart's house grove was throwing like a little thursday night football barbecue and all the defensive linemen were at his house watching the game which was pretty cool and then it looked like heinz i'm going to assume it's heinz's house because there was a big picture of a guy with a 21 and i'm pretty sure it was Hines and Taylor was there. Mac was there. So that was kind of like the running back skill house. So I thought that was awesome. And then Reich went out to dinner with Bruce Smith and Buckner was there again. This was kind of like the Buckner episode. There was a lot of Buckner in this one. And it seems like they're going to try to pick a guy or two marquee players on this team to highlight each week and follow around a little bit last week, Leonard Wentz. So you have quarterback, you have linebacker, all pro linebacker. This week it was all pro defensive tackle. I have a hard time seeing anybody but Jonathan Taylor being the guy next week coming off a five touchdown game. And this is an episode we were really excited for since Sunday because we beat the crap out of the Buffalo Bills. And I thought it was really cool how they did all the Reich stuff leading up to the game because he played there for nine seasons and he had that incredible 30 plus point second half comeback as the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. He sat all those years behind Jim Kelly. So he met up with teammates. I thought that was great when he came out of the tunnel on Sunday, the fans showed appreciation towards him and then they wrap it up. It comes full circle. It's going to be a heavy plane full of respect on the way back to Indianapolis. So I thought it was an awesome episode. We got to see some of the guys' reactions on the sideline to Jonathan Taylor having an historic game. I love the way Leonard celebrates. It goes crazy for the Zaire Franklin interception. I always find it awesome when a guy is happier for somebody else than themselves and how much Leonard just loves to win, and he was talking to Kenny on the side about let's finish this, let's get another turnover. I want to really embarrass them. Like I want the league to look at us like, wow, they destroyed the Bills because he probably had the jet game in the back of his mind. And a competitor like Darius Leonard, that's not going to sit well with him. So I thought it was a great episode, and of course the speech, which we all saw this week, so we knew what that locker room speech was going to sound like with Reich and then Taylor and then... T.Y. hopping on at the end to give a game ball to Frank Reich. Just really good stuff. In-depth again getting to be a fly on the wall for this team. As we make this run, we start 1-4, and and now we're sitting at 6-5. and So to have the cameras there, it could go one of two ways. And so far, so good the last two weeks. The Colts are playing good football. The cameras are there. And at this point, they're clearly not a distraction. So another good episode. I thoroughly enjoyed this one as well, Jason. Loved it, man. I thought it was really, really great. It was cool to see the the camaraderie between the players. You know, you saw the, the D linemen together, which is awesome. And then you saw the running backs together. I think it's a really close-knit team. It's really nice to see that. Not all teams are like that. Uh, you think back to the Pagano days, and I, I, I mean, that was, you know, <laughs> obviously a train wreck but it's really good to see the way like they they kind of embody the coach and like I've had my issues with Frank as far as play calling goes but as far as a leader of men he's second to none man he's a great person he's got all the right core beliefs he's an easy person to root for he's obviously very smart Uh, he played the game so you know the players know that that he's been through what they're going through and so, you know, just seeing the way that the players react to Frank and they kind of take on his personality, they don't get too high, they don't get too low, and it's kind of like a family. And, and that's what you want your team to be. You want to have, you know, a lot of uh, guys in your locker room that you can lean on. And the Colts really have that. They have each other's backs. It's really great to see that. You're seeing that in this show, the way they pick, pick each other up. Um, I, you know, you, you pretty much covered everything that I was going to talk about. The one other thing I was going to bring up was – um, I, I thought it was cool to see the preparation. We saw a little bit from Flus talking about, you know, they're not going to give it to us. We're going to have to take it. You know, you saw that. You saw Frank kind of going through some stuff. And then again, Bubba talking about, dude, uh, you know, Bubba. Oh, my Bubba's God. The man. 
Bubba's the man. He he you know he said McKenzie's going to put it on the ground. He puts it on the ground. I think we can get one, and he he did exactly that. I mean, and he basically said we don't even have to force it. He just the guy just has a problem handling the football. And in the game against Buffalo, we didn't touch him. He just fumbled it on his own. He fell down. He tripped, and the ground caused the fumble because nobody touched him. Right, and you know that's obviously you know great film study. You know, he clearly, he, he really, the thing I love about Bubba is obviously he's on the details. He studies the film and he has these guys prepared and they know what to look for and they're focused and they go out there with, with, you know, with a game plan. And, and obviously, you know, special teams is a big part of, of what the Colts do. It's very important. Um, it's won us some games, uh, the Jacksonville game being the most obvious example, but also Aside from, you know, the seriousness of preparation to a game, you saw him having some fun with Deion Jackson. So it's not all serious all the time, you know, and I think that's that kind of shows the different facets to coaching and, you know, and, and that stuff builds camaraderie in the locker room that they're able to laugh at stuff like that. When Dion fell down, you know, and he got up and he was shaking his head. I thought that was kind of funny. And uh, but those guys work their ass off. Those coaches, I mean, they were they're in there forever and working hard and trying to get the Colts every little bit of edge that they can get. And Bubba, I just I love the guy. He's really made a huge difference. Um, special teams previous to when he got here was not a great. I mean, we we had a good punter, and we had a good kicker, but as far as like coverage units and stuff like that, we were not very good. Since he's been here, we've been really really good. I think we've been top five in everything. So. Yeah. Outside Vinatieri, you know, stink in that one year. That, but that wasn't really Bubba's fault. So, it's I, I, he's been my standout in the first two shows. For for me, I thought I think he's been absolutely. I mean, it shows it just shows how detailed and focused in on the the little details on special teams that he is. And I think that shows how good of a coach he is. It shows how much the players trust what he's telling them. And so I I, I mean, it, it's been a been pretty eye-opening for me because I knew about Bubba before, but you you just see him, you see the juice that he brings. He's such an energetic guy. He hasn't even been retired that long. He's you know he's I think it's been you know maybe five or six. I don't know how many years it's been, but he he's not like you know an old guy. He's still young and he brings a lot of juice. And so that guy's been my standout in the first two shows, and it's just been just been really enjoyable seeing you know the way that HBO's kind of made this really entertaining show so so fun to watch and just like the like we, we've gone into like the cinematography and all that stuff it's all great man and uh and then you see jonathan taylor and with the game he had the way they they had it like slow motion and all that with oh, the yeah. music it was really cool so yeah man I, i'm definitely i know it's a long-winded response to what my opinion of the show was but i thought it was outstanding and i'm excited to see the next one me too i mean from last week to this week, I was pumped, and from this week to next week, I'm pumped, especially depending on how the game goes Sunday. If we beat Tom Brady and the defending Super Bowl champs, I'll be even more excited to see the, it's almost like a post-game show with locker room reaction and just in-depth insight that you just don't see. You get inside access you just don't normally see, so... I'm excited for the next one. When they went to Grover's house, though, did you notice that he was washing the chicken? It looked like chicken wings. He was washing them, but then he seasoned them in the sink, like on the bare bottom of the sink. I did notice that, and I thought that was odd. I thought that was <laughs> a little bit disgusting. <laughs> yes. Uh, I-, I was trying to be a little nicer, so I said odd, but yes, gross. Is- <laughs> all gross I was thinking disgusting. was... These guys are all like, yo, Grove's food's so good. Grove has to open a restaurant. Oh, man, yeah, we have to go to Grove's every night, every Thursday night to watch the game and eat wings and barbecue and ribs. And then they're going to watch this episode, and they're going to be like, oh, my God, like his dirty sink. Why was he seasoning it in the sink? Like the chicken was wet. It was just weird. I have no weird. I have no idea. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure the guys are going to be like, well, what? Like when they watch that. But, yeah, I, I have no clue. I, I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> Maybe he cleaned it out thoroughly first, Luke. I don't know. But I mean, we didn't see that. I was hoping that that's the case. I'm hoping that he, like, really scrubbed down the sink and the sink was just it was clean enough where he didn't have to waste a bowl. But usually I would season the chicken in a bowl. Correct. 
Correct. Yes, <laughs> that's what I that's that's what I would do. That's what I do. So I yes, I was a little confused by that. But I'm going to give Big Grove the benefit of the doubt and say that he scrubbed the crap out of that thing quite literally, and then that's and that's why he did it in there. Yeah. Who knows? You know, maybe he did. But and everybody enjoyed the food, and nobody missed the game due to illness. So it's not like anybody had food poisoning from Grover Stewart's barbecue on Thursday night. So everybody lived. Everybody's fine. There's no salmonella, no nothing like that going on in the Colts locker room. Yeah, that's the best thing, you know. No, no, no illnesses, no odd like you know guys popping up on the injury report. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing crazy like that. So that that's good. And one other thing I wanted to mention, like I, I, they didn't show this in the show, but um, I saw a clip of like Zaire Franklin like talking about like before the game, like talking to everybody. I guess breaking the team down before they're about to play, and he was like, you know, remember what these guys did to us last year? We got to take that shit personal. You know, and he was like, we owe them, uh, you know, and it was just like I was like ready to run through a brick wall. Like, I don't know if anybody out there heard that clip. I forget, I don't know if it was on Colts.com. I forget where it was, but those guys like they just love playing uh, football together, yeah. man. They, they, it's and it's really fun to watch. And like when you and Zaire and like uh, Zaire is like such a huge part of what the Colts do. I don't think he gets a lot of credit nope. and he's a Syracuse guy. So, of course, I'm going to shout him out. But. <laughs> He, he, he deserves it. Like, he's big on special teams. He comes in on defense and makes plays, and he's a leader. Like, he's such a great leader for the team. Like, everybody raves about him. Floose, they, when they asked him about him, said, you want, you know, you want, like, 53 Zaire Franklins. The guy, like, does whatever he's asked. He's a great leader. He's a winning player. I hope, I really hope the Colts re-sign him in the offseason, maybe to a two-year deal or something, because I think – I really think he brings a lot to the roster and I don't think he's going to cost that much. Now I'm getting off into another thing, but the point is I just really enjoy watching the way guys care about one another when they make a play. Like you mentioned earlier when we started about how excited Darius was when Z made that play. And I think the whole bench was, and that's just like every team's not like that. You know what I mean? And to see the way this team, like not only how well they played, but they, they genuinely care about the other person's success. There's no hating on another guy or, oh, this guy's going to take my job or any of that, that stuff that kind of goes on, the jealousy that, mm-hmm. that kind of goes on with some other teams. To see the Colts, you know, really just genuinely care and pull for one another, I think that's special. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I really believe this team can beat anybody. Yeah, well, that and the fact that when you have a running attack like this, it travels in the postseason. You could go to Buffalo. You could go to a cold-weather stadium like Buffalo or Kansas City, and you could beat anybody on the road when you could run the football the way this team can run the football. Most of the time, a dome team is like the Manning, Marvin, Reggie dome teams where it's a air it out offense and then all of a sudden you play in a cold-weather situation and you can't play your normal game. This team, in my opinion, will be able to travel in the postseason. You can't trail big in those games to a point where you're going to have to throw your way back into it. But if you could control the game, I think this is definitely a team that could make some noise if we get into the playoffs. I think getting into the playoffs right now might be harder than making a run once we get in. But yeah, Jason, I mean, I love that selflessness and it's really what it is is unconditional love like Darius Leonard loves his brother his teammate his friend Zaire Franklin like whenever you talk to I mean even like professional athletes who have hit every milestone every achievement division one scholarship played in the NFL or another professional sports league and then their son does something scores his first peewee touchdown hits his first Babe Ruth over the fence home run hits his first three pointer, whatever it might be in youth sports. A lot of guys will say that was the greatest moment of my life watching my son do it because you love your son so much. That's unconditional. And when you have a teammate and that teammate does something where Leonard's never acted like that for one of his interceptions or even like another player who gets it all the time he saw Zaire a guy who came in with him in the 2018 draft class who was more of a special teams guy in the beginning and still is 
primarily a special teams guy on this team, bust his ass in 2018, bust his ass in 2019, bust his ass in 2020. Now in year four, busting his ass once again. Zaire's in a contract year. In my opinion, Zaire will be re-signed this offseason by the Colts, probably. It's not going to be a ton of money because of his role on this team. It's just not like a money-making spot because you are primarily – a special teams player and it's a little bit different than like an Anthony Walker situation where he's looking to start he goes somewhere to start and there's more money elsewhere I don't think that that's going to be the case for Zaire I think he's more valuable to the Colts than he would be to anybody else but to see Leonard's appreciation just how happy he was for his teammate was awesome I love stuff like that I love when a guy's happier for somebody else than they are for themselves and Leonard said it we now are the number one team in takeaways. We are the takeaway champs of the NFL. I think Buffalo's played one less game than us, but we go to Buffalo. We get four. We cough it up zero times. We are the champs right now in the turnover game and turnover differential as well. So, yeah, that whole thing right there, that was dope. And I saw it before the Hard Knocks episode. I saw Leonard's celebration, and it was actually more. It was longer, and it was more extensive on the full video on Colts Twitter, but the whole thing I thought was absolutely dope. Yeah, one other part I wanted to mention before we sign off for the night, I really love Jonathan Taylor, and not just because of his production. Like, one thing I love about him is the humility that guy has. Mm-hmm. Whenever he ever, whenever somebody wants to talk about how great he is, the first thing he does, and it, it you know, it reminds me of Andrew Luck. Mm-hmm. The first thing he does is he talks about the five guys up front, the tight ends, the wide receivers. Like you saw uh, Doyle come over to him when he's on the bench. And he's like, man, great job. And he's like, he was like, great block, Jack. You know, like mm-hmm. he he doesn't want any of that attention. He always takes the praise. It reminds me of Andrew, how he used to do that. Mm-hmm. He takes the praise and he gives it to, you know, the, the old lineman, those five guys up front. And I just really enjoy the way – like the professional way he goes about his business because I feel like that's that type of attitude will never get complacent. You know, he'll never get complacent like that because he's not feeling himself. He's not, you know, he's not dancing all the time and me, 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 me all the time. It's all about team with him. Uh, And, and he clearly has a ton of love and respect for his offensive linemen and, and rightly so because those guys have done a really good job for him. But that doesn't take away the fact that Jonathan Taylor is the best running back in the NFL right now. But I just I love everything about that kid. I'm so glad we drafted him. I was a thousand percent wrong about that guy uh, as far as just, you know, the impact that he has had on this team. I can't overstate it. The guy is just unbelievable. So I wanted to point that out before we signed off, because I think it's something that you see with him every time he's put in a position to take praise. He always talks about other people and gives them credit. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think in the long run, that's going to, you know, make him the best football player he can be because he's always going to be working to be the best that he can be, not for himself, but for those other players, for the team, for the team, because he's all about the team. So Jonathan Taylor's a special dude, man. I'm glad he's on our team. He really is. And I hate to say it, but especially at that position, it's such a prima donna position. You think of guys like Le'Veon Bell, and you could go down the list. We're not going to. And then the receiver position, Terrell Owens, Randy Moss, Odell Beckham Jr. I mean, the amount of guys at those two spots, specifically those two skill spots, running back and receiver. And that's not the case on this team. Jonathan Taylor, Michael Pittman, T.Y. Hilton. We have some real selfless team first guys that love to give credit to other guys. So you see it with Taylor there in the locker room. Everybody's like, oh my God, that was such a great performance. He's like, couldn't do it without these guys. And he goes and gives a hug to, I think it was Mark Lewinsky in the locker room. And T.Y. giving the game ball to Frank Reich. And T.Y. really taking a lot of sacrifices. He's not getting the ball as much as he's gotten it in years past. Of course, he's missed a lot of time as well. But even when he's been on the field this year, he hasn't had the same amount of targets, the same amount of yards and all that. But he's a team first guy. He looked, what do you have, two, three receptions, two, three targets in that game, Jason? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, and yeah, could he have had a bigger long. smile on his face? Could you imagine Odell Beckham Jr. winning by 45 points but only getting two targets, three targets? 
Yeah, that would have been a completely different. It, he would have been salty. He would have been pissing probably, and moaning. He would have yeah. been on. His dad would have been on Twitter talking about who's going to trade for my son next. It's so, funny, Luke, because people actually wanted us to sign him. I know, I'm just like, I know. I do answer. No, yeah, worse, I Jason, he... worse. I mean, I guess I could slightly make an argument for signing. People wanted us to trade draft capital for him. That's nuts. A couple months back before the trade deadline. That's insane. They wanted to give up assets for Odell. I was saying, I'll take Odell if you give me picks. Because then I'm going to have to buy him out of the contract eventually. I'm going to have to trade him where I have to give up draft capital for somebody to take him. Or I have to eventually pay him all that money and eat that money. So no matter what, it's an absolute disaster of a situation. At least if you claim him off waivers or you sign him like the Rams did, you don't have that much invested. But Except yeah. your locker room, dude. Except, Except your locker room. Now I this mean, he's a headache to deal with. He right? is. I think this locker room is so good it could absorb an Odell Beckham Jr., but why risk it? Why throw yeah. a rock in the water? You don't know what the ripple effect could be. And when the locker room is as good as it is, you could go one of two ways. You could say, let's test the water because, in my opinion, we would be able to absorb it. And we'd be able to, you know, expose of him, dispose of him, and it wouldn't be a long-term issue. We'd bounce back pretty quickly because there are so many good guys in this. They're all good. It's an unbelievable locker room. HBO is very – HBO could have won one in one of two ways. Like, HBO would like to have some problems so they could play that up. But I think they realized pretty damn early we don't have to Kardashian this thing up or Housewives of New Jersey this thing up, or Atlanta, or pick any city that they do like those type of reality shows. They could have went villain, and they could have went locker room problems, but I think they arrived with the cameras, and they were like, holy crap, there are no prima donnas in this locker room, so we're going to have to go with the feel good. And feel good has to be good on the field, so you need to actually have a winning record and hopefully make the playoffs and have some type of little Cinderella run to the postseason to make the feel good match. Because if you're all goody two shoes in the locker room and you're not winning, it's like a weird spot for hard knocks to be in. So they kind of need one or the other. They need a bad locker room that falls apart or they need a good locker room that climbs to the mountaintop. And hopefully we're heading to the mountaintop. And to me, it looks like we are. You come off a win against Buffalo, a dominating win like that against Buffalo. And wait, wait, one more thing, Jason, before we wrap it up. Did you notice when Ben Banigou was at that dinner table with Frank Reich? Wait, Ben. ben oh, oh. Well, no, I thought that was. I thought Ben was Reggie White Jr. But I guess he could be Bruce Smith. Yeah, there, but right? still, two hundred sacks is two hundred sacks, and I'm pretty damn sure if you ask Sam Tevy, Ben Banigou had two hundred sacks in August. I mean, listen, Ben Banigou is the greatest training camp player of all time. <laughs> We've had many of them, but he's the top yeah, guy. Nobody tops him. Nobody. And and I mean, obviously, it's a conspiracy to not play him because he's the greatest player to never actually play. It is true. <laughs> it is true. But man, he is one hell of a training camp player. And you could call him Reggie White Jr. You could call him Bruce Smith Jr. You could call him whatever junior you want. If you have 200 sacks and you're up there on the all-time sack list, you basically are Ben Banigou. In August of 2021. So let's wrap it up, Jason. Another good episode. Episode 2 of Hard Knocks. If you guys haven't seen it, go check it out. Because you get to see an in-depth look at this Colts team that you just don't get anywhere else. So it's awesome. Cinematically, the music. I mean, it's all on point. It's all good. I really enjoyed it. Hopefully we go out and we beat... The Tampa Bay Bucks. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, by the way. It's either the night before, it's either Thanksgiving Eve, or maybe we're uploading this on Thanksgiving Day. So, everybody, happy Thanksgiving. Jason, happy Thanksgiving to you as well. You too. You too, my man. I and your family. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your family as well. I appreciate it. So, everybody, have a good Thanksgiving. We'll be back, I think, on Friday night or Saturday morning with the Bucks game preview. And then that Bucks game Sunday, we'll be back Sunday night to wrap that up. So those will be the next two podcasts this week, wrapping up week 12 of the NFL. And hopefully we get a win against the Bucks, and we'll be back next week for episode three of Hard Knocks in season featuring the Indianapolis Colts, the first ever season of in-season Hard Knocks. 
That's my man, Jason Spears. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, and this is the For the Culture Podcast.